Python. Can hear me? Okay, are we guys ready for today's class? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Hello, can you all hear me? Can you all can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Welcome everybody. Um, good evening, everybody. So I'm coming, I'm admitting some people inside the group. So let me. Um, blessing, are you here? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's Zoom class. Blessing, are you here? So bear with me, people are coming in. Hey, I need to know. Hold on. Hey, Sorry, I would not like to waste people's time. Um, is Madam Blessing around? Let's let me see you, please. On your camera, Blessing. <laughs> She's just coming. Hello. You're welcome. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good evening. Oh, hold on. Okay. Yes, you can see my face, sir. No, I can't see you still. Who are you? Somewhere. Okay, I'm coming. Okay. You can start to. Okay, okay.
Sorry, I can't share my screen. Okay, I'm coming. Let me check something. Go on like that. Okay. You can share now. Check. Okay. Check if you can share now. Okay, yes, I can. Okay, go well, start. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just at the back and reading. Enjoy your today, tonight's lecture. Welcome. You can start to remember it's eight um, minutes. Yes. yes. Hey, good evening, I believe I'll just go on. Good evening, everybody. My name is Blessing Amatme, so 500 level University of Calabar. So I'll be talking on danger signs in pregnancy. Okay. okay. Danger signs in pregnancy. Okay. If you ask everybody, I get everybody to say they know what pregnancy is, but for the sake of this, we're saying pregnancy is the period during which one or more fetus is developing inside a woman. So in, there are many criteria that can be used to describe it as normal or abnormal, but one important one is the location of the pregnancy. So an intrauterine pregnancy is described as abnormal, why others are described as ectopic. Pregnancy is divided into three trimesters, and that's very important. Trends, signs, and things of discontinuity of 13 weeks each. Then the last week before the EDD is also part of the third trimester. So for the danger signs, I'll be listing them. I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Can we see the screen? Hello? Can we see the screen? Can't you see it? Let me. Uh, I don't want that to be playing. Flat, flat, flat. Didn't know it. I don't know. I'm sharing it. I don't know why it's not visible. We're well, not seeing your screen, no. Okay. But you see my face. Yes, I can see your face. So well, it's, it's I think the network are hooked somehow. Why are you laughing? Oh. This guy. So let me just continue. I don't know why it's not sharing. So for the danger signs, I'll first of all list them before I talk about all of them one by one. Okay. So you have vaginal, vaginal bleeding, severe nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, decreased fetal activity, drainage of liquor, persistent headache, contractions before term, fever, leg or calf pain, especially in one side, pain on urination, foul vaginal discharge and difficulty in breathing. So we'll start with the vaginal bleeding. In different trimesters, vaginal in once a woman is pregnant, she's not supposed to have any form of bleeding, even squatting. So bleeding is actually a danger sign. In different trimesters, it can mean different things. In the first trimester, vaginal bleeding with abdominal cramping, especially in a pregnancy that has not been confirmed by ultrasound, it's usually ectopic pregnancy. From that, it could also mean a, it could also mean an abortion. The second trimester, abortion is also possible. In the third trimester, abdominal vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain usually signifies placental abruption. Without pain, it signifies placental previous. So in each trimester, depending on what causes, you have to investigate the patient to know the cause. But oh, every sorry, my blessing. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. They say you should go back to the science again. You are too fast. Sorry. Can you go oh, back to the science again? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the signs, I will list yes. them out again. Vaginal bleeding, severe nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, decreased fetal activity, drainage of lycor, gas breakage of water, persistent headaches, contractions before term, number eight, fever, Number nine, leg or calf pain. Number 10, pain on urination. Number 11, foul vaginal discharge. And number 12, difficulty in breathing. Okay. All right. 
I was talking about vaginal bleeding. I said in different trimesters, vaginal bleeding can signify different things. And it can be accompanied by pain and other symptoms. In the first trimester, vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain usually signifies ectopic pregnancy. It can also signify an abortion. In the second trimester, it also signifies an abortion. The third trimester, if it's accompanied by abdominal pain, it will most likely be a placental abruption. But without the pain, it can be placental prevail. So in all this, you have to tell a woman that when, if, if she's pregnant, once she has vaginal bleeding, she should report to the hospital. And you have to take a proper history and investigate that to know the actual cause of the bleeding, to know the cause of management. So for the second one, severe nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting is a physiological sign and symptom in pregnancy. But when it becomes excessive, that it interrupts the woman's daily activities, she can't keep her food and water down, and in severe cases, she's dehydrated. This is really called hyperemesis gravidarium, and this needs to be treated. It's a danger sign. If not treated, the woman can, dehydration has many consequences. She can go into shock. So this has to be treated. The third one, decline in fetal movement. This is usually something they will notice in the third trimester. The time they start noticing their fetal kids varies for primary gravidas and multi gravidas. So if the fetal movement is decreased, sometimes it can be benign, say babies also sleep in utero. But you have to check if the fetal movement declines, it tells them the first thing she should do is to check her fetal count in two hours. So there are many count systems, but using the modified Cardiff count in two hours, if it's up to 10, then most times it's likely okay. But if it's not, she should report to the hospital. So as a doctor, there are many things you can do to investigate this. You can do a CTG for the baby to check if it's okay. You can do a modified biophysical profile. So the management of this also depends on what is the Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, my Mohammed, please mute yourself, please. Please. Let's see, please, you can continue. I was on decreased fetal movement. So the management depends on if the results are good or poor. But every woman, if she feels her baby is not moving adequately, should be advised to report to her place of booking immediately. So contractions before them. In when talking about contractions before them, it's very important to differentiate between false contractions and true contractions. So the false contractions, usually called Braxton Hill's contractions, most times they are not predictable, they are not redeeming, they are not continuous, and then they subside most times with rest and rehydration. So I tell them if the contractions continue after like an hour, they should report to the hospital. So depending on the gestational age of the baby and other factors, including if the amniotic membrane has been ruptured, the management also differs, but contractions before them, even at them, is a very important sign that you should ask the woman to report to the hospital. Then abdominal pain in pregnancy. Abdominal pain in pregnancy is a commonly reported symptom. About 5 to 10% of pregnant women report to the hospital for that complaint. So the abdominal pain in pregnancy can be due to the pregnancy-related causes and non-pregnancy-related causes. Virtually everything that can cause abdominal pain in a non-pregnant person can also cause pregnant um, abdominal pain in a pregnant person. So in such cases, it is very important to take adequate history. And then in pregnant women, the signs and symptoms can be a little bit dicey, it might not be classical. So the cause is actually Diverse. You can have ectopic pregnancy, abortion, leomyelomas, ovarian seeds, rush. Basically, anything can cause abdominal pain. But it's important that while taking an issue, you try to avoid surgery as much as possible, especially in the first trimester in women that have abdominal pain in pregnancy. So history is very important to know the exact cause. Anything can cause it, even acute appendicitis, pyelonephritis. Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in people that might have had artificial reproductive, artificial or assisted reproductive technology. So a good history is very important to avoid unnecessary surgeries in the pregnant women. So drainage of lycol. Drainage of lycol 
it is termed premature if it occurs before the onset of labor and preterm if it occurs before term. In a woman that is term, the energy of life might not be such a bad thing if it's not prolonged. And by prolonged, we mean greater greater than about 12 hours, because prolonged drainage of life or predisposes to infection. So in a woman that is draining her life, first of all, you have to teach them how to differentiate between leakage of urine and drainage of life, because the gravity can press the bladder and sometimes cause incontinence. So you ask them that if they feel something trekking down their leg, they should go to the toilet and empty their bladder. If it's still tricking down, or even if you know, they can report to the hospital, and then you have to examine them properly to be sure you're doing it of life. Home. In the preterm, depending on the age, the gestational age of the baby, you will have to weigh the dangers of prematurity versus chorea amnionitis. And in a premature baby, you have to give steroids to prepare the lungs in case you have to deliver. So that is a danger sign that women should be told about them persistent headaches. Preeclampsia is a pregnancy in this condition. It really presents as persistent headache, visual disturbance, generalized body swelling, and abdominal pain. It's characterized by hypertension and proteinuria in pregnant women, and it can also give rise to other symptoms depending on the end organ damage, especially the liver. The HELP syndrome, HELP, H-E-L-L-P, is a complication of Preeclampsia. So people having severe headache should also report to the hospital. Preeclampsia is one of the major causes of premature delivery because the definitive treatment of preeclampsia is delivery of the baby. And then if it can also lead to eclampsia, which presents with convulsion. So if women, if they're having persistent headache, should not just take paracetamol at home. They should be asked to report to the hospital or health facility. Fever is another important danger sign. Fever is usually a herald of infection. I know that infections in the mother can have great impact in the fetus, especially, okay, in some cases in first trimester, in some in third trimester, depending on the infective agent. And it should not be assumed that it's malaria because it's endemic in such reasons and they just take malaria medicine. So if a woman is having fever, especially high grade fever, you should report to the hospital for adequate investigations and treatment. So leg or calf pain, especially if it's one-sided. Pregnancy is a risk factor for thromboembolism. I know that thromboembolism, if not properly checked, can lead to pulmonary embolism and even stroke. So a woman, first of all, women that are at risk, like men that are obese, women carrying multiple pregnancies, men that have previous history of thromboembolism, blood dyscrasias, Women at risk should be placed on prophylaxis as more low molecular weight heparin. But if a woman complains of this, she should be, she, this is also one to know that she be advised to come to the hospital as the complications are really fatal. So pain on urination. Pain on urination is really a sign of UTI, urinary tract infection, and this is one known cause of preterm labor. Though they said about 10% of pregnant women present with asymptomatic bacteria. But this should also be treated. So pain on urination, if a man has this symptom, she's not as if it's normal. If we ask to report to the hospital for adequate treatment to prevent preterm labor and its consequences. Foul vaginal discharge. This is also a sign of infection. And in fact, vaginal infections are also a risk factor for preterm labor. They can also cause complications in the baby. For example, gonorrhea can cause of thermal neonatorium in the infant. So if any woman notices, and they should also, they should be educated on what shoe looks like at them and then abnormal vaginal discharge. So in both cases, they have to come to the hospital, but they also the normal vaginal discharge during pregnancy. So if they have any foul smelling discharge, they should report to the hospital immediately. Oh, um, Madam Blessing, so, please, um, you try and round up, please. Your time is already going. There are many danger signs of pregnancy, but one in all, prevent, you have to be able to prevent them generally, and that is the goal of the antenatal care. Antenatal care is to prevent pregnancy complications, and even the ones that are inevitable, they should be detected early and treated promptly. So every woman that comes to the antenatal care should be advised on these danger signs and the appropriate measures to take when she notices them. Then they should all be monitored close, the child those are at risk. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for the presentation.
Um, it's time for questions now. You can throw your questions up. Just raise your hand up on your video for you, and then she will answer you back. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, I'm seeing questions in the chat box. Yes, you can start with them now. Okay, somebody say, please, do you count the kicks between two hours or 12 hours? Okay, I say there are many, do I say there are many classifications. The one that you count between 12 hours is Cardiff count. But the modified Cardiff count is two hours. But there are many other classifications. So it depends on what you're using. But the Cardiff count is no longer used because of the long duration. So the modified as the 10 in two hours is what is now used. Then help syndrome full meaning. Okay, help syndrome means hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Okay, when do we say contractions are adequate? Okay, I believe this is referring to labor. But labor contractions, basically, they are redeeming. They increase in intensity and they don't stop even while, even when the woman rests. So once she's having this continuous contraction that don't stop after she has rested, she report to the hospital, whether she's stem or pre stem Hello, somebody has a question um, for you, Blessing. Okay. Ma, please, can go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Sorry, I was like five minutes late. I came in Welcome late from work. Um, blessing, excellence. If I was your Viva examiner, my God, what you've done, this is wonderful. You know, I wrote everything you listed out, very detailed. Vomiting, excessive vomiting. Do not forget high dirty deformed mole of um, in patients yes. coming in with excessive vomiting. You also need to wonder, does she need and a HCG, which will be in the thousands, as well as an ultrasound scan, yeah? Her vaginal um, bleeding. Remember, never do a speculum examination in a lady with vaginal uh, bleeding unless you know the position of the placenta. You know why? Yes, ma'am. They would bleed. We had a case in my hospital. In fact, that was the day that a woman died and the whole ONG department was closed. <laughs> Imagine where one patient would die, the whole hospital was closed for inquiry, and that doctor was referred to the GMC. Patient came in with bleeding and she went to go and put speculum, not even determining where the position of the placenta was, and it was a previa, and this lady bled and bled and bled. So we need to note that. Also, abdominal pain with appendicitis, I know you did mention that the position of the appendix changes. You also need to know when patients come in with abdominal pain, don't forget that it could also be referred pain. When patients come in with um, abdominal pain, especially pregnant women, we always do an ECG because it could also be coming from the chest. You know that the, 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 the what you call it, the uterus kind of pushes up the, the stomach and all of that. So don't, don't forget yes. an ECG. If you have an ECG, please do. Um, it's always good. In my hospital, we have a kind of um, deep stick um, system whereby we can dip and check if it's alkaline or I've really forgotten, but I'll try and remember what it is. That's when you need to do your speculum examination because you want to determine is that urine that's gathering in the speculum, you know, when you put the speculum in or is it um, lycor? Yeah, because lycor is alkaline. We have a way of deep sticking to know whether it is lycor or whether it is urine, that one. Then... Um, Persistent headache. I'm very glad you mentioned a preeclampsia. It's the killer. Your patient, if she has taken a paracetamol, it's not going, you know, we don't give ibuprofen because of a patent ductus arteriosus, something, something, I can't remember. Only paracetamol yes. we give. And then if it's so bad, you can give codeine, but we don't give ibuprofen. Always at that point in time, I don't know if you mentioned blood pressure, you must check the blood pressure. Ask them about a sudden swelling of legs and fingers. They have to take off the rings because um, with wow. preeclampsia, you have generalized edema. Then HELP syndrome. I'm very glad you mentioned HELP syndrome. I have a professor of gynecology here who has written so many books on HELP syndrome. That's another thing that I think we would, we would talk about maybe on another day in-depth. Fever. I'm glad you mentioned fever. Sepsis. 
you also need, you, you guys need to go and find out the cardinal signs of sepsis. Women who are pregnant are already in an immunodeficient state. Anything they pick up can push them into sepsis, will kill them. Uh, calf pain. Blessing, you will go and read about um, uh, DVT and how it is managed in pregnancy because we only give low molecular weight heparin, which you mentioned. If she were a non-pregnant woman, we will give her oral anticoagulants. Like, a, I don't know, have you ever heard of what they call novel oral anticoagulants? Have you heard of that before? No, I've not, ma'am. Okay, so novel anticoagulants are new. We use them in place of warfarin. We'll talk about anticoagulation later, but go and find out. Pregnant women only go on uh, heparin. You don't give them the orals because the oral anticoagulants are teratogenic, can cause cancers in the baby and all abnormalities. Uh, and then pain on urination, very good. If it's a UTI, you need to treat with antibiotics. You, you think about UTI, you also think about a pyelonephritis, which is a, a kidney uh, infection of the kidney. And then foul vaginal discharge. Could it be a sexually transmitted infection? Could it be some other infection that the lady is having? This increases the woman's chances of having endometritis, which can cause premature labor, you know, infection of the membranes and all of that. So very detailed, very excellent. Um, I think just the, the correct, like you were told to slow down. I think you were rushing through it a bit. We are your colleagues, calm down and talk to <laughs> us. It's a discussion. You understand? It's a discussion, but excellent. This is this is distinction for me. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Thank sorry, you, sorry, I take it all that time. I thank you very much for the things you added. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So the next yeah, presenter, that, the next presenter yeah. will be Dr. Mr. Lawe. Are you ready, Mr. Lawe? Are you there? Hello. 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 Who's all here? Hello, Who's all? doctors. Doctors are here. Hello. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Can you hear yeah. me? We can hear you, doctors. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, sorry, I came late. <laughs> I have a, a, a small baby, baby that is always uh -huh. on my <laughs> on my case. Okay. So um. Okay. Let me try and start my video. I don't know what's going on. Can you see me? I can't see myself. We can see you. Okay, let me, let me, oh, okay, okay, okay. Blessing. Hello, Blessing, is she there? Yes, ma, yeah, I can hear you, ma. Oh, good, oh, good, Blessing, you did very, very well. I I, I came in when you were talking about, I think I, I, I met up with help syndrome or something like that, then I now followed through. You did a very good job. You, you, you Thank you, ma. picked out the details one by one. Um. Dr. Oge has already gone in depth into explaining and then giving um, some highlights, which uh, is okay. So this, this danger signs in pregnancy, you know, um, the way I put it up here as a part of community medicine is because we always give health talks to women when we go on outreaches, when we go on you know, health education and promotion campaigns. These are the things, important things that they need to know because most of them do not know, especially in low, low income uh, um, areas. They need to know these things and need to know what to do when these things happen. So we also as health uh, practitioners need to also know these things and know how to deliver these things to them so that they will, they will be able to appreciate the reason why it's very important and it's very important it's handled, you know, the way it should be handled and it shouldn't be overlooked. You understand? So I, 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 I really like the way you pick them one by one and, you know, give details and all that. So this, I'm, I'm, I'm also talking to all of us to make sure that these um, topics of public health importance should be part and parcel of us because okay. We are, we are, we have gone past. Um, I won't say we have gone past. I think we now, based on uh, uh, preventive medicine, more like so that you don't want these things to happen in the first place. And then when they happen, what do you do? Early uh, prevention, or early prevention of complications is key. So when these women or when these care um, parents 
appreciate these things, they now know, okay, this is, this is actually important and we need to, you know, talk to someone about it very early and when it, it occurs so that we prevent, um, you know, uh, things we don't want them, things we don't want to occur, you understand, which, 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 which eventually leads to increased maternal mortality, which is what we face. Down here, maternal mortality rates are very high. So these are the parts of the things that we talk to them about and then the Hello, ma. Hello. Hello. Can we all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think we lost that. Yes. Okay. She has left maybe because of her dead talk. So sorry about that. So right there next on the table is the next presenter. I'll call on Mr. Lee to to, to start his presentation. Maybe we should move. Yes. Mm. Let's move on to the Hello. next. Hello. Yeah? Okay. Um. I think yes. the next is my point. So please, mm. the next speaker should go ahead. Thank you very much. All right, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, sir. You have eight minutes for your presentation. Two minutes for questions and answers. Welcome. Um, my name is Gustavo Antonio. I'm presenting on the topic, on the topic, bad preparedness and complication readiness. Bad preparedness and complication. I will be using the abbreviation of the word bad preparedness as BP and complication readiness CR. That is BP CR. By the way, I will be going on the following outline. Number one, introduction, like definition, maternal mortality, element of CR. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Please, can we hear him well? Can you speak louder, please? Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. How we do? No, we can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, okay, yeah, you now. Please speak louder a bit. Thank you. Okay. I'll be discussing, I'll be discussing on bad preparedness and complication readiness. Okay. Are you Introduction, definition. The voice is the voice is muffling. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Hey. Oh, it looks as if you have some background noise there. Check and stop them, please. So I can hear you. Good evening to you all. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, you know. I am by name Sadi a 500 level medical student from Osman Dafodi University of Sokoto. I am presenting on the topics bad preparedness and complication readiness. I'll be discussing them on the following outline introduction, definition, maternal mortality, elements of bad preparedness and complication readiness. Then I will conclude. Are you with me, please? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Every, 
Every pregnancy is a joyful moment for all mothers who dream of a safe pregnancy and a healthy baby. However, every pregnant woman faces the risk of sudden, unpredictable complications that will end in death or injury to herself or to her infant. Bad preparedness and complication readiness is a strategy that encourages pregnant women, the pregnant women, their families, communities to effectively plan for bad and deal with emergencies if they occur. The key component of globally accepted step motherhood program. Maternal mortality is defined as death occurring in women while pregnant or within 22 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of duration, site of pregnancy, from any cause related to from any cause related to the pregnancy or its management, but not from accident or incidental causes. This can be from either hemorrhage, eclampsia, sepsis, obstructed labor, or complicated complication of unsafe abortion. Majority of maternal death occur during labor, delivery, or within 24 hours after delivery. Apart from medical condition, there are numerous social cultural factors which delay care seeking and contribute to this death, which are identifying the complication. Is a delay among the family that before they even seek for health uh, care, they will have a problem and it's find a, pro uh, a complication in believing whether there is complication or not. Two, decision to seek care, to seek health care. They will waste time for, before they seek, they agree on, on to go and seek for health care, identify and retain a health care facility, then receiving adequate treatment at health care facility. Bad preparedness and complication readiness is one intervention that addresses these delays by encouraging pregnant women, their families, and communities to effectively plan for bad and deal with adequate emergencies if they occur. Elements of bad preparedness and complication readiness are one, registration of pregnancy is very important. To have a, to a, for a pregnant woman to register for her pregnancy. It assists in screening, diagnosing, and managing some risk factors that might affect the pregnant woman or, and, uh, or pregnancy outcome. Booking it of a pregnant, um, pregnancy is best within eight weeks. A woman will, uh, a woman, a woman will visit the booking clinic, register, the doctors will assess her either she is with a high risk, high risk pregnancy or not, and give us some investigation to carry out. Those investigations are back cell volume. The doctor will uh, give us investigation on back cell volume to know the, the normal uh, uh, back cell volume, which the normal when a pregnant one should not be less than 30 uh, percent. We also give her on hepatitis B genotype, also screener on LVO uh, grouping, hepatitis B status, HIV status, urinalysis, and ultrasound scan. This is the first on the list of elements of bad preparedness and complication readiness. Number two of bad, prepared, uh, bad preparedness and complication readiness is knowledge of danger signs of pregnancy. As a doctor, you have to teach your patient, your pregnant woman, those danger signs of pregnancy, which are bleeding, vaginal, vaginal bleeding. You have to tell her it's a one of the risk factor of uh, danger of pregnancy. If you encounter this, if you rush to any nearby clinic for assessment.
Uh, one, another one is convulsion. It says danger sign of pregnancy, severe headache with blood vision, fever or weakness, severe abdominal pain, difficult breathing, and sores and testes. If you tell her, if you encounter any problem of uh, among these danger signs, let her nearby head facility. And now number three is plan for where to give birth. Plan for where to give birth. You should put her in, put that in mind from the day that she conceived that, uh, or from the day she took her pregnancy. She has she should have a, a plan for where to give birth. Arrangements, proper arrangements, funding and other things. Immediately after, uh, if there is any neighbor, you should wish her nearby clinic. Plan for skilled birth attendance. The minimum for this is a doctor. If you visit a, a doctor, is a skilled birth attendant that can uh, admit her for delivery. The next one is plan for transportation. She should save money for transportation from her home to the healthcare facility. It's uh, for uh, health assistance. Bad companion to be with her. If a bad companion is with the, the woman at bat or accompany her to the health emergency care. Identification of compatibility blood donor. Let her arrange for a, for a, a donor in case of hemorrhage or emergency, in case of emergency. Bad preparedness and complication readiness is a process of, plan, of planning for normal bad at, and uh, Normal but and anticipating the action, uh, the action needed in case of an emergency. Thank you all for your listening. Okay, type of questions, please. You can raise your hand. Question, any question, please. One question from Mr. Lawi, please. Okay. No question. Yes, Can there are questions. There are questions. So. Okay, questions. I'm coming. Uh, yeah, where are you? Jane, huh? can you hear me? Okay, let me on the video for you now. Okay, ask your question, please. Okay. Hello, everybody. So, Mr. Lawi, I didn't get the fourth, um, the fourth element of bed preparedness. Plan for something after plan for where to give bed. I didn't get the fourth one. Companion. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your question. The next the after plan for where to give birth is the next one is for skill birth attendance. It's not I didn't quite get that, Lawi. I'm sorry, but I didn't hear you. Can you say it again? Hello. Do you understand the question, Mr. Lawi? No, can she ask the question? Sorry, can she ask the question again? Okay, and Jane, ask your question again. Okay, I just said that I didn't get the fourth element for birth preparedness. After plan for where to give birth, what is the next? And the next one is plan for skilled birth attendance. Skilled, is it, did you say skilled birth attendance? Yes, ma'am. Okay, skilled. Skilled birth attendance, okay. Any other question, please? I have a comment. Okay, ma'am. So, um, Mr. Lawi. Yes, ma'am. Hello? Well Me done. Too. Well done. I think it was just issues with your, um, with your audio. 
but this is this is really really lovely and i'm glad i've attended this because there are many things that i like to discuss with my patients when they come so you did talk about uh, where the patients want to give birth i believe yeah location yes do you see lots of patients coming and saying they want to give birth at home Ma? Do you have do you have a number of patients requesting to have their babies at home? Ma'am, majority, majority of them prepared that, ma'am. What? Some of them prepared that. Okay, fine. Why I'm bringing it up is that, funny enough, in the UK, people are now moving towards. They say they they're trying to um they're trying to just say demedicalize giving birth. Women request to have children at home. When I came here, I was really surprised to hear that because in Nigeria, when I was in Nigeria, people, people always want to come to the hospital to have their babies. People here decide they want to have their babies at home. Then for those that come into hospital to have their babies, you have what you call consultant-led deliveries and midwife-led deliveries. So the midwife ones are straightforward, uh, pregnancies, no complications. Baby is facing a, a baby is a what? Vertex. Exactly. Straightforward. Then the the um, consultant led deliveries are maybe women who have had previous big babies or there's a history of uh, previous miscarriages and things like that. So some studies that were done, some psychiatrists released some papers. I'll try and find it and share on the group that a woman's choice of where she wants to have her baby has a huge impact on the delivery outcome. You know, so it's good that you mentioned that. And, and these are things that as doctors, in as much as we want to be autonomous and making this decision, in today's world of medicine, it's all about patient-centered care. Once you can rule out any risk factors and uh, this woman is gonna be safe, where she's going to be, it's important that we try and take the patient's wishes on board. And also when you mentioned a companion, here you see people who say, oh, I want my father to be with me. I mean, the kind of strange, strange requests. There was somebody that said they want their astrologer. You know, things you'd be like, are you pick your partner now, pick your husband and go in. They were, I think there was one who requested whether they wanted an animal or something. We said, no, 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 that one cannot happen. Just pick a human being that will follow you. So. I'm glad you mentioned all these things, who the woman wants to be with, having a skilled birth attendant. And also importantly, um, you, you talked about blood grouping and saving just in case the woman hemorrhages. And yeah, thank you so much. Really, really thank you for this topic about birth preparedness and complication readiness. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ma, for your contribution. Thank you. Um, we can move to the next presenter. Emmanuel, are you here? Emmanuel Kezia from UNN. Are you here? I'm, I'm here. Yeah, good evening. Okay, let me. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, it's been a good evening. presentation. Um, okay, good evening. Oh, um, my name is uh, Chila Gorom Emmanuel. I'm a 300 level medical student of. University of Nigeria. So, okay, um, my topic is uh, importance of immunization. Um, in a public health. Are you your camera? Are you your camera, chief? It will be. Okay. 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 Well, health seminar like this particular almost important to get right. around issues without talking about immunization. Um, um, then from there, the types of immunization, then some diseases patient is given. And lastly, the importance of immunization. Okay, immunization. Immunization is actually a procedure by which the immune system is fortified or strengthened 
to fight against a specific disease or a specific pathogen. Now, oh. I'm like passive, I'll take pass, passive immunization. Oh, Mr. Passive Mr. immunization. Mr. Imane, hold on, please. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Um, they are complaining that they can't hear you. Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Um, I said that uh, immunization, immunization is a procedure by which the immune system of the body is strengthened or fortified to fight against specific diseases or pathogens. And I said I'll discuss the types of uh, immunization that we have, active immunization and active immunization. Now, passive immunization is produced without challenging the, the immune system to the immune system to like the immune system must do nothing. Something else is introduced and the artificial passive immunization. A natural passive immunization, um, we, we see that in uh, um, before and after birth, before and after birth, before birth, a mother a mother transmits or transfers is in form of antibodies, immunoglobulin G, to her baby through the placenta. And this uh, immunoglobulin G, of course, they are antibodies that will help the baby, the poor baby that almost that doesn't have uh, uh, any antibodies yet, to be able to resist diseases or resist pathogens. Then after birth, through the breast milk, through the breast milk, uh, uh, immunoglobulin A, which is also an antibody, is transferred to the baby. This thing, this, this uh, antibodies help the baby, they fortify the baby to be able to resist infections in the early stage of life. Now, the next, um, the next uh, uh, subtopic I'll handle is active, active immunization. The, here, the, the, the immune system is active, actively participating in the job of protecting the, the body. Now, um, active immunization, uh, it can also be natural or artificial. In natural uh, active immunization, the body, the body on its own develops antibodies or develops in immunity against certain infections in, in which uh, clinical or in clinical or subclinical. Now, um, Artificial immunization, this is actually where you can't do it without talking about vaccination. Artificial active immunization involves fortifying the immune system by introducing vaccines, vaccines which, which, which um, mostly can be dead pathogens or life but atten attenuated uh, anti uh, pathogens in order to stimulate an immune reaction in order to stimulate immunity of the body against those pathogens. Now, the next uh, 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 subtopic I said I'll handle is uh, some diseases. Immunization is given. You have whooping cough, you have measles, you have polio, yellow fever, varicella, that's chicken pox. You have um, rotavirus, virus, influenza. These are diseases that in the past have claimed so many lives, but due to vaccines, we almost have zero cases of them. Like in Nigeria, I think this year, Nigeria was declared polio free. Polio is, is a disease that rendered so many people deformed, so many people uh, uh, paralyzed. Now, due to vaccines, many, of, many people, like we can go around freely now without having fear of uh, getting polio. Okay, um, the next on the line here is um, importance of immunization. Immunization by vaccination is one of the greatest achievements of public health in human history. Now, um, according to the WHO, each year, vaccines prevent more than 2.5 million child, birth, child uh, deaths. That's a, that's a whole lot of number. That's a whole lot of number. 
And uh, okay, imagine the, the novel uh, coronavirus that has claimed almost the life of lives of uh, 1.3 million people because there were there were no vaccines. It took the world by surprise. There were, there were no vaccines. Now imagine where there was a vaccine. These people would have still be, uh, been alive. These people would have still been alive. So uh, um, immunization saves lives. Immunization saves lives essentially. And um, according to WHO, I'll, I'll still quote them. They said that. With the exception of safe water, nothing else had had such a major effect on reduction of mortality and mobility on population growth as vaccination, that's immunization. And um, the next uh, importance of uh, immunization is its economical benefits to the society. Um, most of us can see it. We've seen, we've seen what the uh, coronavirus did to the society economically. Many people lost their jobs. Many people we are told to work from home. So many things changed. And this thing affected a lot of lives negatively. Okay. So um, it's obvious that vaccination saves lives. Vaccination saves the economy of a country. Now, um, the last importance that I will list here, I will state, I will state here is uh, the fact that immunization protects the society. It protects the uh, younger generations. For example, now, a woman, a pregnant woman who has been uh, immunized against varicella, that's uh, chicken pox, will have, um, uh, her baby will have slimmer chances or almost be safe from getting that uh, infection. Okay, um, that will be all for now. That will be all for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Emmanuel. Uh, one quick question for you right away from Mr. Isaac. Are you there? Are you there? Okay. Um, the question is, what is the main point of I'm concern? Here. I can hear you. What is the main point of concern in regards to the usage of life attenuated vaccines? That's a question for Mr. Isaac. Okay, life, life, life att attenuated vaccines yeah, life attenuated, attenuated vaccines. Um, okay, they are used for um, infect, uh, uh, diseases like measles, mumps, rubella, yellow, yellow fever, and the rest of them. They 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 they, they stimulate the immune. Um, are you getting the question? Can you hear me? To the infection or uh, break down the body. They, are, they give the, the immune system a leverage okay. below and fight them. Yeah, that's essentially what they do. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel you, you've answered the question. Though. The question is, what is the main point of concern, concern in regards to the usage of life attenuated vaccines? Can you attend? Hello? Sorry, I didn't hear you. I said, I did, I don't feel you answer the question well. The question is, what is the main point of concern, concern in regards to the usage of life attenuated vaccines? It's not talking about the key vaccines. So life, the, the main uh, concern. Are you attempted? Um, of course, I, I think I've, I've, been, I've been able to, to... Okay, let me call Mr. Isaac to, 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 to ask if he have he will be satisfied. I don't know. Mr. Isaac, I will I will on your video now. Okay. Mr. Isaac, let's see you please. Okay. Yes. No time. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, I asked what was the main point of uh, what is the main point of concern in the usage of life attenuated vaccine? While life attenuated vaccine is a type of vaccine which you don't actually give it to all kinds of individuals. You don't give it to immunocompromised individuals as it has a lot of uh, effect on such individuals. There could be side effect of such vaccine on such individuals. That was why I asked that particular question, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, answer the questions. But just to add a little, I think there was a place I read about it in first aid. 
that life alternative vaccines should not be given to immunosuppressed persons, except for the MMRO vaccines, which is the mumps, um, measles, and rubella vaccine. So, any other question for Mr. Emmanuel? Measles and yeah. Let me see your hand, please. Okay. I Just... have. Uh, okay, my uh, Yes. I don't know if it's a question or if it's a comment. Um, um, Emmanuel, I, I thought your topic was importance of humanization. Emmanuel, was that your topic? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, yes, yeah, you, you gave us a very good background, the types of humanizations. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you, you kind of went around it. Um, I'm not sure if we really, really, I don't know if it's just me being rather particular, but I think we, it's just like, if we want to tell people now why you need to get yourself immunized, do you see? You gave us the definition of immunization. You told us the types, um, you told us types of vaccines. Do you understand? Do you think you really gave us what the importance of vaccination? Yeah. Let's say I come into your clinic now and I'm a child, I'm a mother who doesn't want to, I don't want my child to be uh, vaccinated. Do you think you have convinced me? Question. Hello, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, come on. Hello? Yes, yes. Um, the, I stated the, the I stated the, I stated the importance of uh, immunization at the end of okay. my lecture. Okay. So, um, uh, for, a mother, for, for a mother that uh, comes to me, probably to, to say that uh, she doesn't need her child to be vaccinated, she's mm -hmm. um, um, uh, exposing her child, obviously, to risk, to risk of uh, getting uh, infection, yes. getting uh, diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that them, it was, uh, is... okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ozo, Dr. Ozo, she's not here. She's not here. All right, Emeka, over to you. Sorry, thank you. Okay, Jane has, Jane has a question. Jane has a question. Hello, hello, hi there. Okay. Hello, yeah, hello. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Well, I can hear you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, who can hear you? Oh, okay, okay, fine. Um, um, Emmanuel. Hello, is Emmanuel yes, there? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, it's... good. Um, yes. you, you, you took us on immunization and importance of immunization, right? So, uh, yes, yes. For you, you said you are in three hundred level. Am I right? Yes, ma. So that's second MB class, right? Yes, ma. Okay, good. Uh, you did a good job, you know, based on your level, because um, I like the way you started with the background, classified, you classified it, and you, you brought it home. Uh, but uh, you didn't really go in depth into the importance, because um, that's the main, you know, topic for the day. The epidemiology you did was good, giving us statistics and all that, you know, you, 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 you helped us to appreciate you know what you're talking about but the topic is important so if you're talking about talking to if you're going to talk to a lay person which is i mean which is what it is on the importance of immunization you need to be seen Hello. to give them point by point importance of immunization. Let me give you an example for, for, did you talk about prevention of outbreaks? Emmanuel is, Emmanuel is still on? Yes. Emmanuel, I'm talking to you. Um, I, I, did I hear I you did. mention prevention of out, outbreaks or epidemics when we are talking about importance? Okay. Did you talk about something you called I didn't, head immunity? I didn't use the word prevention of outbreaks. I said it protects the future. Uh, but you, you need to say the word outbreaks and epidemics because you know we're just you know talking about pandemics and epidemics this period. Somebody would expect that you use the appropriate word, okay? When you say outbreak and epidemic, 
it helps the person you're talking to to know the the you know to understand better what you're talking about you know using the using examples let me give you an example of what's going on now in nigeria in some parts of nigeria have you heard that there's an outbreak of yellow fever or have we heard yes, yes ma'am. there's currently yes, an outbreak yes. of yellow fever i mean yes if there's an outbreak of yellow fever one would now be asking isn't yellow fever part of our routine immunization? Why are we having outbreak of yellow fever that we've not have we've not had in a long time? You know, so when you're talking about this, things, I expected you to give examples and say, okay, this is what exactly happens when a community is immunized. There's something you call head immunity. I don't know whether you've heard about it before. <laughs> head immunity, when you know a good number of people in a particular community or in a particular region are immunized. We kind of give, um, what it does is it reduces the number of susceptible hosts to that disease. And what it does is to prevent that community from having coming down with outbreaks. So when immunization coverage is not, you know, optimal, this kind of things can happen. And this is what we're ex experiencing now. It means that at some point or something happened maybe due to logistics or due to something that we need to find out what happened and why did those communities that were mentioned skipped or why did they stop receiving immunization or what exactly happened? So when you give examples like this, you help, it helps to drive home the point that immunization actually prevents you know, outbreaks and epidemics from occurring. Then, um, this one is on a general note. I want to, I'm talking to everybody now. When you're giving a topic, try to stick to your topic. Don't digress too much because it's part of your scoring. When you're giving a topic in, in an exam or you're, try, you're told to deliver a health talk on radio, and the radio station gives you 15 minutes. I mean, you don't have time to digress. You hit the nail on the head and make sure that your audience grabs whatever you're going to talk, talk about. Okay, so this is on a general note now. Everyone, try and stick to your topic. Do not digress too much. It's good to give examples when you're talking, but do not digress too much so that you, you're on time and also the audience picks up whatever you're meant to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Emmanuel, you hold on. You, have, you still have a start to additional questions. So I will invite Mrs. Jane to come over. Wow. Jane, are you there? Yes, Miss Jane, thank you. You can ask your question. Please, my question still borders on um, what Isaac asked about the main point of concern with regards to the usage of life at Genesis vaccine. I didn't get the answer to me i only heard something about immunocompromised people i didn't get the major point of concern the reason okay 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 the question was told at him and then i think he could not answer it um the point is you have to be careful most especially for immunosuppressed persons you know the life alternative can actually cause reinfection are you there so, so if your immune system is not strong enough Let's say, for example, you have uh, the, the patient has it and a low CD4 count of about 200. That can lead to the reinfection of that um, um, virus in the form of vaccine. So you have to be careful not to give uh, attenuated vaccines that uh, to people who are immunosuppressed. That's the point. Are you okay now? Yes, yes. So is either you go for the for the kid ones, like polio now, polio has the life and the kid one. If the person has been no suppression, for example, now you can go for the kid one, that's the, the Sabine vaccine. Thank you. Um, Emmanuel, there's another question on the comment box here. The question reads, please, is there any difference between immunization and vaccination or are they the same? Mr. Emmanuel, are you there? Okay. Um... Yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm still here. Um, there is a difference. They are, although they are used interchangeably, but there is actually a clear difference between the two of them. Vaccination, vaccination involves 
administering vaccines, which I said you have the uh, the dead. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, you go, go on, go on. Can you hear, all right. Yes. The, the two words are used interchangeably. There is actually a difference between them. I said that immunization is fortif fortification or strengthening of the immune system, of the immune system to be able to resist infection. Why vaccination is a method of achieving immunization, which which is what administering vaccines. That's all. Okay, thank you. Now, because of time, uh, we'll go to the other presenter of the day. Um, Mr. Mr. Mohadulai, you'll be taking uh, national programs for immunization. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, let me see you. Um, can you see me? Okay, go ahead. You have eight minutes, two minutes for questions and answers. Start. Uh, okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abdullah Mudassir Muhammad, 600 level medical student in Osman Abuda University. I'm presenting our national program for immunization. And um, although it's it's meant to be like a tabula stuff, so probably I'd use a projection from my laptop. I was supposed to share the screen, but it's a bit difficult. So I'll just use my laptop to show you guys. Okay. Um, this is the topic, National Program for Immunization, the schedule, and that's my name. Now, by way of introduction, the development and use of vaccines has a long history dating back to 200 years ago. Chief, sorry, Chief, and, uh, sorry. I feel your, I feel your projection is shaking. I can, I can barely see them, please. It's shaking. Make, okay. make, make the camera a bit steady, yes. How about now? Um... Better, better, better now, better now. Okay. Yes. The high point in history was reached in 1977 when this smallpox um, campaign started and it was declared to be eradicated three years later, which was in 1980. That actually marked the milestone for vaccination. Now, vaccine is the most important cost-effective technology for improving health generally. And the World Health Organization, as earlier stated by my co-presenter, stated that about 2.53 million deaths occur annually due to vaccine-preventable diseases like tuberculosis, measles, and the likes. Now, for an ideal immunization schedule, which is what I'm taking as my core topic, it has to follow some of these guidelines, which I will mention. The first one is that it needs to be epidemiologically relevant. Now, there is no importance for having an immunization schedule whereby one of the components of that schedule doesn't meet up with the disease prevalent in that environment. Like, for instance, in Nigeria, we are not predisposed to Japanese encephalitis, neither are we predisposed to tick-borne encephalitis as such. Such um, disease vaccine should not be a component of our own immunization schedule. The next, um, the, the component of the immunization schedule should be immunologically competent. As stated by my co-presenter, they need to be able to boost the immunity of the recipient so that they might confer protection at least for a longer duration, maybe 20 years or more. Then it should be technologically feasible. It should be socially acceptable. Now, why? Because in places like, especially in the center where I school, there is this fear that vaccination tends to castrate males. As such, they tend to refrain from using vaccination. So through programs like um, health talks and awareness, they have been made known that uh, immunization actually helps to boost the immunity rather than, cost, rather than to cause side effects like deafness and the things they usually share. It should actually be affordable also, and it should also be sustainable. Affordability has a bearing on the sustainability. But the good thing is that vaccination in our place here is actually free of charge, which actually helps in a long way for making people to go for the vaccination. Now, this is the recommendation of vaccination in Nigeria. At birth, the child is supposed to take the oral polio vaccine zero, the bacillate of calmate and guerin, and also the hepatitis B virus vaccine that's at birth. And although the site will be explained later by the third presenter, so I'll just go through what it entails. Now, for after four weeks, 
four to six weeks after delivery, the child takes the second course of the vaccination, which includes the oral polio vaccine one, the penta one, which initially used to be only three, but was now made to become five. And of these five, the components include the hepatitis B virus vaccine, the diphtheria vaccine, the pertussis vaccine, and the tetanus toxoid vaccine. And also the last component is the hemophilus influenza, specifically the type B, made up the five components of the penta. Then the last one is the mococcal conjugate vaccine one, which is given six weeks after delivery. Then four weeks later, they take the second the third course, which is OPV2, penta two, and the mococcal conjugate vaccine two. Then four weeks later, again, they take the OPV3, penta three, PCV3, and then the intramuscular or the yeah the intramuscular or the injectable um polio vaccine which is the sulk the opv which we mentioned earlier is called sabine and is given orally while the ipv is called the sulk and is given intramuscularly then at six months that is roughly four months after the last course three months after the last course actually they start taking the vitamin a and the dose is usually 1000 international unit 100,000 international unit and from that point you mark it and the patient start taking every six months you have two minutes more you have two minutes more okay okay i will hasten up they come subsequently for each um call after six months of taking the first vitamin a then they, at nine months they need the measles and the yellow fever at the 12th month they take the vitamin a the other polio vaccine booster and the meningitis, then at 18 months, take the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, then the chipping bug, but that's the varicella. Now, why malaria is not included in this uh, immunization schedule is because of the following difficulties. One, it has high genetic complexity, which makes it to have these rapid changes. As such, a human can't mount immunity against malaria. Then secondly, the parasite changes to several stages, so they don't know which stage they will use for vaccination. And also the malaria um, has several species of strains. This is just a sample of the various vaccines available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madulahi. Um, we need questions from mentors. Mentors, please, any question? I want to see your hand. Mentors, any questions? Uzo, Dr. Uzo. Hello? Yeah, comment from you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, um, the presenter, Muda Tseh, right? Yep. Did I get the name right? Hello? Hello, okay, yes. let me go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Abdullahi, right? Yes, I can hear you, man. Yes, okay, man. good, good, good. You did a good job in the presentation. That's um, MPI Nation schedule. So, yes, so, thank you. Yeah. Very good, because um, when you're discussing this topic or this um, subtopic, you need to make the women or the caregivers understand what they are going to face. Because some of these women don't just tell you, I'm going to vaccinate my child. I'm going to organization. It's very important to understand that when we are teaching them, we go in depth to teach them what and what you're receiving. What is it protecting against? Which diseases? Is it protesting against? They need to understand it because when you just mentioned, okay, this is, you don't even understand what it is. But when you pick them one after the other and say, Penta one contains. Well, I can't hear you again. Are you, are you here with us? Um, I think Point, okay, this vaccine is going to protect against tetanus, which is something like this, which shows something like this. And you know, when they appreciate those things, they are okay, they are even uh, more likely not to miss their immunization flow because that is what we encounter. They come for the first dose, come for the second dose, and they disappear. Why? Because they didn't understand. Exactly. 
why you know they are going for these things. They just follow every bandwagon effect. We are going for measure. Oh, we are going. Let us go, and all that. But because that's what, that's where we have um, dropout rates. Calculate dropout rates. Because when they when they and it's, and it's done by saying um, what do you call it? Penta one rates minus penta three. Because it's found out that people start the vaccine, they don't complete it. So when you have you know like seventy people coming for penta one, at the end of the day, when you follow up those seventy people up until the time they're supposed to get at penta three. And you realize that 49, you now have a list of 49 people coming for Penta 3. What, what has happened? It means that people have been lost to follow up. And if you don't complete a vaccine or complete an immunization for a particular disease, it means it's as good as useless. Because you came for first day, it doesn't mean anything. You have to complete it. So that's why we try to explain this schedule to them so that they understand that if you come on the on the sixth week day, you also need to come on the tenth and the fourteenth to complete that one. Then the next one is so and so day. Try and uh, come and you know complete it to be able to protect, give your child that protection, that full protection from this vaccine. Because if you don't, it's, it's the one you came for is as good as, is as good as useless. So I like the way you broke it down, but let's you know, also be conscious of breaking those components of the vaccines down to the different diseases, relating it to the different diseases and what they can present as so that they know that they might, they might even, you might even be shocked because there was a day I was giving a health talk. Let me give you an example. And I talked about uh, vaccines, the component of the vaccines and I talked about PCV. They were like, what's that? What's PCV? <laughs> conjugate, blah, 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 blah. What they said, they kept on saying, Doc, what is it? What, what, which disease are we talking about? Because we are so used to yellow fever and measles. They were, they were hearing PCV for the first time. They didn't know what it was. So I had to break it down that this PCV is a, vaccine, a new vaccine that, that was when it was initially introduced, when it was still new. The new vaccine that protects our children from pneumonia. Midla mentioned the word pneumonia. They said, oh, okay. You know, this is what they can relate to. Everybody knows, most women, most mothers know what pneumonia is. You know, of, of course, you know that once the child is breathless and blah, 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 and all that. But mainly I mentioned the word pneumonia, the point, I, I, I hit the point for them. And they're like, okay, is that what it is? You know, they understood it. And they knew that they actually, one woman as I said that pneumonia actually kills a lot of children in their area. In as much as mococcal vaccine is not um, the 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 uh, uh, that's trapped in mococcus is not the only you know cause causative agent of pneumonia in children. You have your and that's why you now have your uh, you also have your hemophilus influenza type B for a certain age group of children. So when you tell them these details, little details, it helps to make them complete these things and know the importance of these things. So. Thank you once again for the way you broke it down. I, I really love that and you did a good job. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Ma. You're welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the corrections. I'm grateful. Dr. Sylvia, do you have any question, ma'am, or any contribution? Um, just well done. Well done, uh, Mother Sil. Well done. Thank you, I, I was following it and I'm glad the way you broke it down and took your time to show us the screen. And sticking to the points, yeah. And old doctor also has said everything. Well done. It's it, for me. It's a revision. Thank for you. Me, it's a revision, and I've I've used this opportunity to sit down and learn this. Thank you. Um, Thank you, doctor. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Adula. You have to hold Thank on. You. you have a question for oh. Mr. Isaac, your colleague. Isaac, sir, you can okay. drop your question. Let me see you. I hear him. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. His distance is still mute. It's mute. He should unmute himself. Okay. Mr. Isaac, unmute Thank yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Go on. Go on. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. Thank you for the presentation, sir. Um, you talked about the vaccines, and uh, you made mention of BCG. So we, we expect that you tell us what disease condition does that BCG 
you know, uh, what disease condition do we give that BCG to, to care for? And also, if we talk of vaccines, you, you're supposed to tell us of the challenges associated with these vaccines because um, there is this issue of cold chain, how vaccines are produced and delivered to such individuals. So you, we needed to hear something like that. Thank you, sir. It's just a contribution. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Isaac. Um, the reason I'll answer your question, but the reason why I didn't go detailed into stuff like the cold chain and the rest was because there's also a third part of this very presentation which talk about the body sites of injection and the roots of injection. As such, I believe that should be covered under that. Then for the full meaning of BCG, it also actually means bacillus of calmate and querin. And it's actually a vaccine that fights against the uh, black plague, that's the tuberculosis. So if given, usually it reduces the chance of a child developing tuberculosis infection. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I've answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Adulahi. You have really shown um, an increased knowledge of medicine being here since. Kudos. Thank so, you very much. We are gradually unwinding. Uh, the last presentation is from Mr. Victor. Victor, let's have a presentation. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go on. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll be taking the roots of our administration of this uh, immunization and the contraindications. Okay. So, as the last speaker mentioned, at bet. We give them BCG, OPV0, hepatitis B, and this is given intradermally at the right upper arm. That's why when you see children, you see that mark, as we know, or if you see where this vaccine is given, or this immunization is being given. Then at six weeks, we give them the pentavalent 1% and the OPV, the rota 1 and the PCV. Um, the rota 1 and the OPV is given orally, as we all know. The OPV zero is also give, given, uh, it's called oral polio va uh, vaccine, so it's given through the mouth. Um, the penta valent vaccine is given intramuscularly at the anterolateral anter anter thigh. Um, at 10 weeks, we have the penta 2, the OPV 2, the rota 2, and the PCV 2. The PETA-2 is given intramuscularly at the anterior thigh, like I said. So all the pentavalent penta vaccines are given intramuscularly at the, at the, at the lateral thigh. You can choose either the left or the right, depending. Um, at the 14 weeks, the only addition to, uh, we have there is IPV. And IPV is inactivated uh, polypacin, so it's obviously given through the mouth orally. Then at six months, we give them the vitamin A, the first dose, and is of course orally through the mouth. Then at nine months, we give the measles vaccine, the yellow fever vaccine, and the giantess vaccine. The measles and the yellow fever is given subcutaneously at the left upper arm. The yellow fever is given at the right upper arm. Then the meningitis uh, vaccine is given at the anterior thigh, intramuscularly. Can you hear me? Can hear you go on. Okay, then at 15 months and above, that's when we now give the second dose of uh, the measles vaccine and uh, the vitamin C, which is given orally. Okay, then we go to the contraindications. You don't want to give um, immunize a child that has a history of allergic reaction to a previous dose. Let's say you are the person immunizing and then they bring the child and they say this child has reacted before to maybe the first dose. It was you, you are not the person that gave the first dose. So you don't want to immunize that that child. You want to at least investigate, know what, what is the child reacting to. Then you don't want to also um, immunize a child that has severe immunodeficiencies. You, you also, 
wants don't want to immunize a pregnant woman, you know, especially for the live persons. You have two and minutes left. Two minutes laws, left. Then you don't. Want to, okay. You also don't want to immunize childs or children that have febrile illness on the day of immunization. If a child has fever on the day of immunization, you don't want to immunize that child. You also also don't want to immunize a child with generalized skin condition for obvious reasons because um, you don't want to introduce um, something. You don't want to introduce a bacteria in, you know, by, by just administering um, your needle. Okay, then you also don't want to immunize a child that uh, is on corticosteroids, which I think is uh, for the corticosteroids have uh, immune debilitating uh, side effects. So we don't want to do that too. Um, there are others like history of uh, encephalopathy unattributed to another identifiable cause within seven days of the previous, previous vaccine administration. So I think that will be all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions and commentaries from members. Hello. Next. I want. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Can I hear you, ma'am? Go on. Okay, um, Chulaka, well done for your presentation. I have a few uh, things to add. When you were talking about the, the body sites for immunization, okay, 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 you know. the, the first, the one you give at birth, you said you have OPV, BCG, and what again, but that is being said intradermally. Okay. Do you mean you give all of them intradermally? Because I expected you to have split them into uh, their sites, the exact sites. There's a reason why this topic is chosen. Sites, body sites for mention, because a lot of people don't know, they are confused. They don't know which one is given at which site. And then if you're the, the doctor and you're going on supervision duties and you see that maybe the person that is administering the vaccines is not doing, doing it the right way. It's, in your, it's your duty to correct, do the correction, what we we'll call supportive supervision. It's your duty to do the correction in a nice manner so that you, know, you don't see it as uh, you know, something else. But you need to know where these sites are and the vaccines that are given on this site, the individual vaccines. Is it the left or the right leg? Is it the left or the right arm? You need to be specific because there are specific under our Nigerian MPI schedule and sites. There are specific sites. You don't say that I left on the right, choose anyone you like. No, there are specific sites that when they go on training for this um, vaccine uh, administration, they shoot them these specific sites so that they don't mix up vaccines and then they don't also confuse the caregivers and the mothers too. You know, and then they don't also confuse themselves when they're giving the vaccines. You know that if you turn the left thigh, this is what I'm giving. If I turn the left, the right thigh, this is what I'm giving. And it's the same thing that is going to be given in Enugu and it's going, the same thing that is going to be given in Abuja so that people don't get confused and you don't mix up uh, these vaccines. So that once you say, okay, the vaccine on the, that was given to me on the right thigh costs so and so and so. Why, would, why do we say all these things? Because... There are things you call adverse events following immunizations called IFE. I don't know whether you've heard about it before. Like that's left, why, though. that's part of the reason why. Hello, can you hear me? Chilaka okay. left. Okay. Where are you? Chilaka left. Okay. I'm talking to everybody now. Okay. Because, yeah. I, I, would have, I would have loved him to be here to, to get these corrections and, and, and correct himself. Yes, so there's a reason why you give these things at specific body sites because of those things we call adverse events following immunization, IFEs. Discussing what after immunization, you can easily pinpoint the vaccines or the components of the vaccines or the, the the whatever that was given on that site that is causing what is causing, and that that was given on a particular day or at a particular age of the child, so that you don't get things mixed up. So I didn't quite like the way he said you can be given on the left or the right side. No, there's a particular site for each vaccine and should be followed strictly like that. 
that's how we learn it and that's how you teach other people uh, 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 uh. And how that's how you, you, you commit corrections when you go on supportive supervision to, to these um, health facilities where they give um, immunization and vaccines. He's back. I guess his network was back. Welcome, Mr. Victor. Chilaka, Chilaka, are you back? Yeah, back. Yeah, Hello, back. Chilaka. Yes, yeah. I was talking about the way you presented your body size for immunization. I, I wasn't quite, um, I wasn't happy with it because um, there are specific sites. There's a reason why we have specific sites for immunization. And for vaccines, you don't just say it's given on the left or the right. You pick the specific site for that particular vaccine, mm -hmm. so you don't get confused. Caregivers don't get confused. The people that admission the vaccines don't they don't also get confused, so that you can also trace IFIs when they come up. Come up. Then when you talked about um, uh, okay, thank you. Vitamin A, uh, giving vitamin A and giving vitamin C. You know, strictly speaking, those things are not vaccines, right? Hmm? Strictly speaking, they are not vaccines. Yes. Yeah. Get the point? But they're added there, they are called supplements actually. But they are added there so that um, these children don't miss them. Because if you tell them, okay, go home at six months, buy, go and buy vitamin A and give your child, most people will not do that. And because we are trying to prevent um, those micronutrient deficiencies. That's micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin A deficiency, vitamin, vitamin uh, iron deficiency, and iodine deficiency. So each any particular uh, opportunity to supplement to prevent those micronutrient deficiencies is welcome. And that's why they were actually incorporated into immunization schedule so that you are sure they are getting these things. So when you're talking about immunization, strictly speaking, try not to, <laughs> try not, I know it's a bit difficult because it's just there on the schedule and tabular form and all that. Try not to mix it up, especially when you're asking questions so that actually tell the person, when you're done with the vaccines, you can now say, also there are some okay. nutrients that are fortified okay. and this is when they are given. Don't make it a, a routine to us to all rattle it down like that. Separate the vaccines from the supplement. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Tom. Uh, Mr. Chilika, I hope you've noted those points. Also, you have a question from Infinite Hot Hate. Let me invite him here. Infinite Hot Hate, let me see your question. Ask your question. Put on your camera while waiting. That dark. Hello. Do you, do you have a light or something? Yes. Okay, you can go ahead. Unmute yourself, please. Unmute oh, yourself, we can't hear you. Uh, my question. You can hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Hello, you can hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I said um, he talked about, okay, he talked about the time that there might be some cases whereby um, a child might meet um, immunization of vaccine due to sad the person is ill on underlying issues. That's why at the time he talked about some contra um, indications. So um, my question now is, assuming the child missed that, could it be, um, could he still have chance to gain that um, vaccine possibly when he must have passed the ideal age? Something like, just like he said, six months, several, uh, most of them. So could he have opportunity to take that vaccine anytime He's passed that in. Is that just my question? Okay. Hello? Yeah, I've heard you. Okay. Um, over to you, Mr. Victor. Thank you. Mr. Victor, next to you. Uh, thank you very much for the briefing. Okay, thank you very much for the question. I, I feel, personally, I feel 
if you don't get to immunize this child at that point, you can still administer this um, immunization later, later on at all. I believe that the purpose of this immunization is to cover this child. I believe why they are giving early is because the, new, the newborn child does not have so much immunity. So you want to cover them as early as possible. But if for certain reasons we can't give them at that point in time, I believe you can still do them at, a, at another time when maybe you must have addressed the issue um, at hand, considering that some of these, some of these uh, immunizations have a life span. Some of them, they will tell you, uh, this one will cover you for 10 years, you know, this one can cover you for 15 years. You know, so if you give it at a later time, it will still work. But the purpose of giving it that early is so that it starts covering the child very early from this infection and so that the child doesn't have uh, get mobilities from diseases he or she shouldn't get. Uh, yeah. That's what I think. Uh, if anybody has different um, issue, um, opinions, they can. Okay, anybody that have opinion can support. Did anybody? Have... Anybody to, to support? Uh, Any of our lecturers can also. Okay, it seems known. Um, there's also another pending question for you, so I will invite. Mr. Emmanuel. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes, please. Hello. Yeah. Um. Sorry. I wanted to, you know, add some things to what, you, like I said. Okay, ma'am. If um, if a child misses a vaccine due to illness or something like that, the child has opportunity to receive that vaccine at a later date. Reason being that you don't want this child to miss out entirely on the vaccine. The reason why you have uh time frame. It's just so because it's the earlier you give the vaccines, the, the better, actually. But that doesn't mean that once you, once, for example, if you miss that of 14 weeks because the child was severely ill, that you say, okay, 14 weeks has passed. Let's move, let's wait for nine months and then take measles and unifiva when you've not taken the last dose of pentavalent vaccine. The point, the, the point of immunizing has, has uh, you know, has failed. So, once the child gets better, they even tell you there, once the child gets better, or if for any reason the child can't come on a particular date, you can still come when the child is better to you know, take uh, the vaccine. Now, there's something I wanted to add. I don't know whether someone mentioned, the person that was talking, talked, that taught us about, uh, was it Abdullahi that taught us about the different uh, immersion schedule, right? Yes, I, I can't remember him mentioning the the lifelong tetanus vaccine last, for for, okay. for females. Did he mention that? I, mm -hmm. I, I can't no, remember I, hearing it, but I don't know whether everybody anybody heard him. No, I didn't. I didn't. No. The lifelong. Okay, good. So it's important that um, that is mentioned because um, uh, you're trying to. Because of course, we all know that tetanus is a very you know deadly disease, and uh, we don't want that to you know affects the children and uh, so we have uh, remember initially or it still it, it still happens when a woman is pregnant you're told to come for tetanus um, vaccine tetanus toxoid twice in pregnancy right do you remember that yes ma'am okay good so now there's, a, there's now a schedule for women of childbearing age. Women of childbearing age will be from 15 years to 45 years. They are advised to take the five dose tetanus toxoid, uh, 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 tetanus toxoid to prevent for life. Because when, when, when they notice that um, some people, when they take this, uh, once they take during pregnancy, Sometimes they don't, you know, they might go to another place when they are pregnant again. Some maybe a maternity or somewhere that is not accredited and they even forget to take these vaccines and then something happens eventually and the child comes down with um, tetanus. So it's been advocated now that that five dose tetanus toxoid is that all women of childbearing age gets it and completes it. Take take one at at contact. That's T zero at contact. Second one is taken after one month. The third one is taken after six months. The other one is taken. The fourth one is taken after one year. 
then the last one is taken after another one year. So like that, the woman gets five dues and that covers the woman for life. So if you get pregnant next year, next two years, next three years, next five years, you don't need, even need to bother taking that tetanus vaccine again. And with that, you're covered uh, all through your, your experiences of childbearing and reproductive age. So I, I, I wanted to mention that you know, so that we know that that's an important um, addition also to, to the immunization schedule in as much as it's not for, it's not directly on the child. The, the women get to get them so that they can prevent, you know, distance from, you know, tetanus from being transferred to the child. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear my point, right? Uh -huh. So it's important. So when you're talking about immunization and schedule, make sure you add this tetanus, five dose tetanus um, toxoid for females of childbearing age. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's so pertinent. Thanks for the massive stuff. Um, Chilaka left and, and, and then came back now. Mr. Chilaka, are you here? Okay, you back. Victor, are you, can you hear me? There's still an outstanding question for you. Why you need to? I think the last person should teach and then we can, Victor can answer his on the WhatsApp group. Okay, yes ma'am. Thank you very much ma'am. Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Uche, I have your presence so. Are you here? Ma, I've not seen Mr. Uche. Uh-uh. Uche, yeah. I sent him. I sent him. I sent the topics to everyone and requested that they confirmed. How come he's not here now? I don't know. Wow. I've been looking for him since. I want us all to be participating in these teachings. It's for every everyone's benefits. Yeah. Right. Um. Okay. If he's not here, then. I don't know. Dr. Ozo, what do you think? Should I feed back to him? I don't know why he's not here. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Ozo. Okay, um, he's the one that is Dr. Uche, um, sorry, Uche, Uche is supposed to take us on sampling methods, methods, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. dear. And, oh, Hi. oh wow. Wow. <laughs> well, there's nothing much you can do now since he's not yeah. here. I think we should just, uh, you know, give our closing remarks and round up and then mm. maybe, because, I mean, for him not to be here, something, you need to get back to him to know actually what's going on. Yeah. Since he got the memo initially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did. I sent him a message, but I sent the topics to everyone individually. So that's. And, 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 he, and he confirmed receipt, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this yeah. was yeah. yesterday. I sent him topics. He said, all right, ma. Oh, so wow. he got it. Maybe, maybe if we have um, another next week, if we have community medicine, another this thing. Okay, next time um, we'll have community medicine. Yes, it can research. Yeah. It should just be True. research. Yes. True. True. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. America, our moderator, you have done an excellent job. Ma, thank you thank very you for much. Keeping, thank you yes, for keeping all of yes, us. Yes, well done. Well done. Well thank done. You, you did tried. so well. Thank, thank you very much. Time keeping and, and, and all so, that and extra comments. Yes, you did very well. Thank you. Yes, so, yes so thank you. And yes, to all the excellent speakers. I, I mean, yes, I'm enjoying yes. these sessions. I'm enjoying them. Thank you. Blessing, Emmanuel, Abdullahi, then you said Lawal, right? Then you said on Tadisu. anybody. Victor. Uh, yeah, yeah, Victor. yeah, Victor. We all did so well because, oh, well. I mean, the, the, the essence of this thing is to get you to get used to speaking yes. About okay. health conditions. Yes. I mean, you need to get used to speaking about them because I mean, if you don't, there's no way you can relate in ends or to the community where you find yourself. So mm -hmm. the more mm -hmm. you speak about them, the, 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 the better you are at it. True. Able to True. pass your message. True. True. Okay, for organizing. Thank you so much, Dr. Susan. Thank you. Okay, moderator. Ah. Are you? Ma, can we join for another day? Yeah, let me take the closing. 
<laughs> Vote of thanks now. We just close. We don't finish. Thank you so much. All right, Mark. Thank you very much. I want to really All appreciate right. everybody for coming today. I've been amazing, man. Thank you yes. very much. Charles. Thank you. Thank you. And good night, everybody. All right, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. So the next the next session will be on Friday to be cardiology. I will put the topics tomorrow morning and um, inform everyone. And I'll pick one of us to moderate as well so that we can be sharing the work among us. Yeah, thank you. Good night. Good night everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, good night. Good night.